the, the next uh, um, speaker of our conference is uh, Professor Sam Gurol, um, who has been um, uh, director of Mag uh, Maglev Systems at General uh, Atomics, uh, which is a very well-known company uh, based in uh, San Diego. Correct. Um, Sam Gurol has been involved with, uh, with many projects uh, related to uh, the maglev uh, technology and has been uh, kind of inspirational for me and many others uh, in learning about uh, what has been done and what has been actually built. You know, he's going to talk a lot more about this, so I'm glad to introduce him. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I appreciate being here, and I appreciate following my colleague Marcel. And I have to tell you, uh, Marcel, one of my fondest maglev experiences over the last several decades was the maglev 2002 conference in Lausanne. That was a real highlight, not only for its technical depth and my learning about Swiss Metro, but also just the geography and the friendliness of the people was amazing. So I really enjoyed that. Uh, I do want to, while we're waiting for the uh, screen to show my slides, I also want to tell you that I've been lucky that over the last several decades, I've been involved with a number of maglev development projects. I didn't realize it until I decided to come up with a title for the talk that they've all been electrodynamic maglev systems, repulsive maglev systems of the type that Hyperloop uh, is currently planning to use. So what I thought would be interesting would be to tell you a little bit about worldwide maglev systems, my interaction with some of the uh, projects over the decades, and I'll show you a number of pictures where I look a lot younger. I know it's hard to tell from the distance, but you'll see that I have much more hair and it's less white. And so it's kind of interesting to look at these old pictures of yourself. Uh, but uh, what I hope to do is to give you an overview of what different types of magnetic levitation and propulsion systems are being used around the world, then tell you about my experiences in leading some of the activities involved with developing an urban transportation system uh, with Department of Transportation funding starting in the early 2000s to working on a superconducting maglev system that involved uh, uh, it's a rocket maglev for the Air Force. So it's uh, pretty exciting. And by the way, you know what's great about uh, the time it's taking? It's allowing me to give my talk without the clock starting to tick because I have quite a few slides. I did want to say that uh, the history of maglev is interesting. It seems to go in cycles. And I think, as uh, Marcel pointed out, uh, we've in many ways been there before. Maglev started in the early 1900s. Maglev uh, technology does go through several decades of cycles. So it was almost 100 years ago that the idea of maglev uh, was uh, put forth. It was in the 1960s and 70s that much of the early theoretical work was done on maglev technology in the United States and in Germany. Uh, and specifically in the United States, there was a significant amount of work being done at the national laboratories, as well as at automobile companies like Ford Motor Company. Many of the theoretical foundations of developing the description of levitation systems, and in particular, electrodynamic and superconducting maglev systems were developed in the late 60s and early 70s. And in fact, one of your keynote speakers tomorrow, um, uh, uh, Mr. Powell, his father, uh, collaborating with Danby, Powell and Danby, developed a superconducting maglev concept in the early 70s that was later adopted by the Japanese called the MLX. So I'll be telling you about those. So the history of maglev is just fascinating. Uh, so my history is that I got started with uh, maglev technology in 1993 when a group of business leaders came to my company and they said, we want to build a maglev system because we think it's an efficient way to transport people. That's how we got started. Uh, we did some laboratory prototyping to demonstrate concepts and such, but it wasn't until seven years later in the year 2000 that we received our first increment of funding. And that was a significant amount of funding. 
uh, Congress appropriated uh, or funded uh, $50 million towards urban maglev transportation technologies for uh, the US. And my directions uh, from the panel were develop a concept for urban transportation that had not been done before. And uh, so one of the guidelines we used was what are the requirements for this kind of maglev systems? Why are maglev systems not more universally being considered or adopted? So what we did was we said, well, people talk about the cost of maglev being high. So why is the cost high? Well, we said, what are the different kind of maglev systems? There is an electrodynamic maglev system that works by producing lift due to forward motion that involves a very simple guideway. And the advantages of that kind of suspension, which is called an electrodynamic suspension, is that you can operate with a very light vehicle. You don't have any heavy equipment on the vehicle. The air gaps that you generate are significantly greater. So the idea is that the guideway tolerances with which you have to construct the track are not as severe. I do have quite a few uh, videos, so it would be nice to be able to show them. So these are the, kind of the topics that I wanted to talk about. I'm going to focus on the basics of EDS levitation and LSM, linear synchronous motor propulsion, talk about uh, the projects that I led, which was the urban maglev project and the superconducting rocket maglev project, and just looking into the future, which is always fun. Uh, forget the details on this chart, just look at the dates European inventions started in the early 1900s uh, to now where we have maybe a handful, maybe five or so maglev systems operating in the world. There are two types of maglev systems. An electrodynamic system where you have magnets, either permanent magnet or superconducting magnets mounted on the vehicle. An electrically conducting track, which could be nothing more than copper or aluminum plates, there's a good reason why you don't want to do that, but theoretically, that's all it would take. The vehicle would start out, as Marcel pointed out, uh, uh, on wheels. Once it reached a certain critical speed, there are enough currents generated in the conducting track that it produces lift. And I'll show you the details of that more in the following slides. But that's an electrodynamic system. Uh, the advantage of that is that the vehicle is lighter. You don't have any levitation power equipment on board the vehicle, and the air gaps that you can attain are very large, ranging from two and a half, three centimeters up to 10 centimeters, typically. Then there is an electromagnetic or EMS system, which consists of electromagnets that are mounted on the vehicle. The electromagnets, when they're excited, get attracted to an iron rail on the guideway. There are gap sensors that precisely measure the air gap, there's a feedback control system, and it provides a very nice, very stiff magnetic suspension, uh, but it requires you to have very small air gaps on the order of a centimeter or less. And uh, there are a number of examples of these systems working worldwide very nicely. But the disadvantage is that it's a small air gap and it's actively controlled. In terms of propulsion, all maglev systems require a linear motor. There's no way getting around it. If you take a rotary motor and unroll it, you get a linear system. And when it's energized, it provides a force. There are two, fundamentally, two types of linear motors being used in maglev. One is a linear induction motor, which uses a conducting plate for the rotor. And the other is a linear synchronous motor, which uses magnets on the rotor. There's a video showing the magnet being unfurled And just looking at examples of linear synchronous motor and linear induction motors being used around the world, on the left we have uh, the system that I developed, which uses linear synchronous motors mounted on the guideway, propulsion magnets on the vehicle in this wraparound structure, and that provides the thrust force. 
Uh, another example is that being used by the Transrapid, which is the German system that is now operating in Shanghai, China. Linear induction motors are typically used for lower speed urban vehicles, and a linear induction motor is typically several meters in length mounted under the vehicle. Here you see the Linemo line in Japan, and there's a conducting rail in the middle of the guideway. A number of rail systems around the world also use this system. The worldwide maglev systems are shown here, and with the exception of the MLX, the high-speed Japanese system, and the general atomic system that I was involved with developing, they're all, uh, they all use electromagnetic suspension for levitation, and uh, the MLX and the GA system use EDS levitation, MLX uses superconducting magnets. Uh, they are now testing high temperature superconductors, which have big advantage. Uh, and they have a long stator LSM, and the GA system uses permanent magnets for the EDS levitation system and a long stator LSM. This just shows some pictures of some of the um, some of the connections we made over the years, and uh, this is the Korean. UTM test track, which operated between 1990 and 2000. Dr. Inkun Kim, a very good friend of mine, was the father of the Korean maglev technology, and I was lucky enough to be able to hire him in 2000 to help with our maglev development to capitalize on lessons learned. Uh, the system now is beautiful and running at the Incheon Airport uh, in Seoul. It's about a three-mile airport people mover system. It's absolutely uh, exquisite in its design, and it goes right into the airport terminal. Just a beautiful showcase for maglev technology. So if you ever go to Seoul, make sure you ride it. This is the Linimo line in uh, uh, Nagoya, Japan, built for the 2004 World Expo. These are just pictures we took when we were there. Uh, a number of years ago, here we are meeting with the president of the HSST, Mr. Fujino, who later became a very close friend. Uh, another maglev system that uh, sets the standard for high-speed transportation is the Shanghai Transrapid system built by Siemens and ThyssenKrupp. It started operations in 2004 and uh, was built very quickly. This is the kind of acceleration it has. For $6 one-way ticket, you can ride 19 miles in about seven minutes. It's a spectacular ride, and it works beautifully. This just shows a full-scale cross-section of that to give you an idea of the scale. Here you can see the um, levitation magnets. This is the Japanese MLX. Uh, this uses superconducting magnets mounted at a number of locations here. Superconducting magnets are racetrack coils about a meter and a half or so in length. Uh, I learned a lot from the Japanese MLX, a lot of lessons learned in terms of making superconducting levitation systems work. One of the challenges with superconducting magnets is that they're very prone to losing superconductivity. It's called quenching by a small thermal uh, in, uh, incursion. And when you have a transportation system that's constantly vibrating and oscillating, you have lots of potential sources of heat input. And it doesn't take very much, no more than a few milliwatts, uh, to be able to quench a superconducting magnet. So there's a lot of work. They also use a lot of aerodynamics to get the right quality. Uh, here we are in the cabin doing a little over 300 miles per hour. Again, a spectacular test system. So jumping topics, basics of EDS, levitation, and then LSM propulsion. A lot of the equations for a simple one-dimensional plate track are very simple, but they highlight the characteristics, which is that if you plot air gap versus speed, you start off on wheels, and then at a certain speed, in, for urban, this would be a low speed, you get a levitation, and as the eddy currents build up, you taper off in air gap. So in this case, this was for our urban maglev, it's a 25 millimeter air gap. Problem with uh, that is that if you plot the forces as a function of air gap, there's also shown green here a drag force. And the drag force, this is magnetic drag. This is unavoidable. And if you have a simple plate track, they can be 
many times that of the levitation force. So that's why you go into heroics designing a track with transposed conductors and such. It gets it to be fairly co complicated, even though the principle is very simple, the implementation is not so simple. And from a control point of view, imagine that you're accelerating at, uh, and we were targeting about 0.12 G, although we tested our system to much higher accelerations. Uh, overcoming this drag force is a big deal, and controlling the system while you're doing that. Uh, I'm going to just point out here that also the magnetic suspension stiffness for an electrodynamic suspension is very important. If you design a suspension that's too soft and you load it with passengers, then you find that not only the levitation but also the drag force goes up significantly between a light vehicle and heavy vehicle. And you really don't want that. One of the advantages of an electromagnetic suspension is that the air gap is actively controlled and you can adjust for load. This is a simpler suspension, but you have to make sure you design it properly. Now in terms of propulsion, I'm going to show you the linear synchronous motor configuration we used where we have a vehicle mounted on the vehicle as a haulback array. Haulback array is from accelerator physics days. Accelerators used this many decades ago. They're permanent magnets about five centimeters on a side with the magnetization rotating from one magnet to the next. That produces a very pure, very nice sine wave with low uh, higher order harmonics. And on the track, you have a stator windings, in this case, a three phase system that also produces a wave. And the propulsion for a linear synchronous motor is a result of the interaction between these two waves. Now, where those two waves are with respect to each other is very critical because if you have magnets that, uh, or if you have a position not right, then you can get either a force pushing you up or down, which you don't want. So you want to be at the precise position so that you get effective forward thrust with minimal vertical component. So those are some of the challenges with that. So the control system and the position system are very important. Uh, also, an electrodynamic system, unfortunately, has to deal with very substantial six degree of freedom motion. And so you have many forces that affect all of the harmonics or all of the uh, degrees of motion from yaw to drag to lift. And it's very important to understand what those forces are so that you can design the safety systems that can handle that. Also, you want a system with outstanding ride quality. After all, why use maglev if uh, all you want to do is go fast. You also want excellent ride quality and you want efficiency. So we spend a lot of time understanding the magnetics uh, and uh, the dynamics of the system. In terms of levitation, I'll just say that uh, if you look at the this as being the forward direction, that we also use a haulback array, which, and we use a two-sided haulback array because one of the things that you want to do with a EDS electrodynamic suspension is you want the suspension stiff. One way to do that is to increase the field. The way you increase the field is you have magnets on top and bottom, you double the field. The uh, magnetic pressure goes as field squared, so if you double the field you get a much stiffer suspension. The other problem with EDS systems is the magnetic drag force. The magnetic drag force results from the vertical component of the field, which is here. And if you look at the vector orientation, this upper component goes up, the lower one goes down, so they tend to cancel. So you can get a significant reduction in the drag force and make a much more efficient maglev system using a trick like this. And then the control system has to be very sophisticated in that you have a closed loop system, which is a very fast inner loop, making sure you get the right currents, and then you have an outer speed loop that allows you to uh, correct for the speed. The idea is to have a pre-programmed uh, profile that you can very accurately follow. But let me tell you a little bit about the Urban Maglev project. We covered most of this in the opening. We started in 93, and it wasn't until 2010 that we felt the system was ready to go to, I call it deployment. It's really not so much deployment as a real demonstration track. 
This is uh, the vehicle concept we developed, two body modules connected by an articulation. The levitation and propulsion magnets are in this wraparound structure. Linear synchronous motor, levitation track are on the elevated guideway. And this is a, kind of a collage of pictures from early days of doing lab testing to building a 10-foot diameter wheel that was, could spin up to 100 miles per hour to test lev levitation, to groundbreaking, to test track construction. And there I am on the left. That was 2004, 2005 timeframe. The maglev system that uh, we developed, uh, well, the track is shown here, aerial view, about 450 feet long, all full-scale components. This is our first chassis. And I have a video of this, but maybe if we have time, I'll wait until the end and play a few videos for you. Uh, this is more details of the levitation components. Initially, we used optical position sensor, which we later converted to a magnetic position sensor because it needs to be robust to all types of weather conditions. And this is a video which I'll show that uh, shows the levitation air gap as you're moving. Actually, we had National Geographic filming a segment on us, and uh, they put the camera under the vehicle. You also need to have block switches where you don't power many tens of miles of track. You my, you power only the section of track around the vehicle. So you have an electrical block that's moving with the vehicle, and you use solid state switches to be able to do that. Uh, the other thing we did, uh, these are all the, of the uh, program activities for developing the technology, including giving rides to reviewers. And uh, I'll tell you, if you give someone a ride on this, the review goes great, but you give the ride before the review. And then they, uh, they're just delighted with uh, what they've observed. Uh, this is two of the chassis we built connected by an articulation. And by the way, it proves that the ride dynamics is dramatically improved when you have a longer vehicle. And so one of the mistakes we make is we have very sh sh small chassis, short pods. The ride dynamics is very different than a longer vehicle. Uh, this is uh, our cargo version. Uh, we tested a cargo version first time in 2006. I'll show you a video of that. We also did some fiber reinforced concrete testing. And so as I pointed out, the next step here is to construct an actual operating demonstration system. I'm going to turn to the rocket maglev to kind of finish up on a fast note, so to speak. This is uh, really a cool project. I got involved with this uh, in 1998 when we were having problems developing this concept because the superconducting magnets were quenching and we didn't know why. The idea is that the Holloman high-speed test track has been operating since 1954, and they test vehicles up to Mach 8.6 for a variety of high-speed tests that are necessary for the Air Force. What they do is they have a rail car, just attach a big, big old rocket to it, fire the rocket with the payload, and do your test. And in fact, it's interesting that at, once they reach very high speeds, they put the vehicle through a um, plastic bag that contains helium gas to reduce the aerodynamic drag because it's traveling so fast and the aerodynamic drag just dominates. Well, that's why having a three-stage rocket, which is what they use, helps. <laughs> uh, but the problem is wear and tear on the rails and the ride quality. The rail they have is shown here with a slipper that's mounted on the vehicle. You see the slippers and rails here. And by the way, this is just a bit of history. They have a museum there, it's cool. They actually did manned testing up to 600 miles per hour to see the effects on the human body in the 1950s and 60s. So it's very interesting, the things that went on. So the Air Force, what they wanted to do is replace this with a maglev system. And the reason is really summarized on this one chart that shows the G levels experienced by the system as a function of frequency and this is where the hypersonic rail or the main track uh, end up at about 18 to 80 Gs. What they want is this red curve that is a standard missile at three and a half Gs. The yellow shows what the maglev, and this is based on testing, is able to accomplish. So the maglev really accomplishes their goals of a good ride quality 
without any contact, so there's no wear and tear. That was the reason why they wanted to do it. So the work started on this in 1995. We built quite a few feet of track, about 2,100, 600 meters of track, and it was tested up to 633 miles per hour a couple of years ago, which I believe is the current maglev speed record. And the major components are the vehicle, which is not very long, maybe seven, eight feet long, with a series of rockets in the back, and superconducting coils mounted on the vehicle that interact with copper rails on the track. These are the superconducting coils that uh, General Atomics uh, developed, and they're uh, very uh, high field, about three Tesla average, 6.6 .6 Tesla on the, uh, on the coil. And again, remember what I said, that for electrodynamic levitation, field squared is what's important. So you really get a lot of beautiful magnetic guidance and very good lift. And I'll show you some videos if uh, time allows. This is just a end view of the system with the rockets and the superconducting magnets, copper rails. And this is the system being readied for launch. Uh, there was a sense of humor because they put this nose cone on. This was an experiment done by one of the universities, air to high speed aerodynamic testing with sensors, and they call it the shark goblin here. That's what it says. And so this gives you an idea of the scale. These are the rockets in the bag, a lot of data acquisition. This is a head-on view of the track. And so that's the maglev program summary. Uh, they are hoping to expand the capabilities in the future to build more. Uh, they did have one mishap where they actually ran off the track uh, because uh, they underestimated the magnetic drag. But uh, the system really is ready for deployment and we've transitioned from a few uh, 100 miles an hour up to over 600 miles an hour, and the behavior is exactly the way we were predicting. So it's uh, uh, all the projections for going to much higher speeds are good. So hopefully that program gets funded for a future uh, expansion. This was my uh, final slide. You know, maglev is such an exciting technology. Every time you hear about maglev, it captures people's imagination from all walks of life. The thing that's been challenging for me is the more you do, the more difficult the steps get to get to the next step. And partly because the amount of funding you need to go to the next step becomes greater. Uh, also, there is an issue of, well, what's the need? It's very important to identify what this particular technology is serving in terms of the need. For the Air Force, it was very clear. There was a need to go very fast because they were getting wear and tear on their rails. This was a much cheaper solution. For urban maglev, I could argue that, well, a light rail system with uh, an efficient uh, electric motor would do just as well. So it's really hard to uh, see the future unless the need is clearly identified, you do need really good political support and an active research program, which is why I'm excited to see this conference taking shape because it's the beginning of a research program, a kind of a resurgence of maglev. And maglev is kind of uh, like a two decade cycle from what I've observed over the years in terms of gaining interest. So one of these days, I think it is going to take off and lead to something and perhaps this is it. So if it's possible, could I, uh, well, I don't know if I have time, but could I just go through some of the videos? I appreciate that very much. Oh, uh, no, let me start. Uh, let me start by uh, showing, let's see. Uh, okay, this way. So is that, okay. This uh, shows you our first chassis uh, 2009, running on our maglev track in San Diego, California. Uh, this is the basic track without any significant things on it, uh, no seats or anything. Later, we loaded it up with thousands of kilograms of lead bricks to see the effect of mass, of weight. And so uh, that uh, demonstrates that. Let me show you the levitation system. Uh, here you are starting off on the wheels with the camera under the vehicle and your speed builds up 
and then your air gap starts getting bigger until it, it's about an inch and an uh, inch and a half, right about there. Now it looks like it's very rough ride quality, but the secondary suspension is taking up all of the uh, bumpiness of the ride. So on the vehicle, it's just like butter. It's just beautiful ride quality. Uh, let me see. Uh, but the, this is an early rocket maglev launch. It's only 423 miles Five, an hour, but I thought it would be interesting for three, you to see it. Two, uh, this first one, one is zero, at uh, normal speed. And there's nothing like a rocket firing off, right? It's pretty cool. Now here, this is showing the levitation. This is slow motion. Just watch this air gap here, watch it grow. You can see it picking up. So it picks up to a height of about uh, one inch. And it's very, very stable because the fields are significant. These are about the same fields as the Japanese Two, MLX. One, and here's zero, a full speed fire. firing with a wider view. And it's really pretty cool. I mean, it's exciting when you're there and you see this rocket firing. Uh, this, the faster launches are even more exciting. And the thing that brings it to a stop is the magnetic drag. That's all we have. Copper plates, they're the worst thing for efficiency, but the beauty is they stop the vehicle quickly. And uh, when you have a big old rocket, it doesn't really matter. You don't worry about efficiency as much. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention and hope I can answer any questions. Exciting. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, it's really hard. The question was, what are the differences between uh, the uh, electrodynamic and the electromagnetic suspension, and what about the issue of cost? You know, uh, when we compare the cost of maglev in general with conventional rail, the big cost difference, people don't compare costs on an apples-to-apples -apples basis usually. If you uh, look at the cost breakout. The maglev technology itself doesn't add a lot to the cost. What really adds to the cost is that maglev systems are great separated. They're elevated, separated from traffic. That's what really adds to the cost. In terms of the differences, your specific question between an electrodynamic and an electromagnetic system, I don't think there is going to be a lot of difference. There is going to be uh, some differences in performance, perhaps. I do think that at very high speeds, an electrodynamic system is a better approach because it is potentially safer if there's a problem with the levitation control system. I don't think there's going to be a big difference in the cost. The electromagnetic suspension systems have a number of advantages, though. One of them is that I think, especially at the lower speeds, they have better ride quality. Uh, the other thing uh, is that uh, they're very efficient in terms of magnetic drag. They have virtually no magnetic drag. So it's really hard to say which is better. Uh, I think it depends on the application. If I were designing, even though I developed an EDS urban maglev system, I think for urban transport, an EMS system would be better. I think for ultra high speed, an electrodynamic system would be better simply because the vehicles are lighter and also fail safe in case of power failure. What do you mean by speed? Pardon me? Oh, um, well, for transportation, the Transrapid was doing, what, about almost 300 miles an hour, 265, 270 miles an hour. I mean... Okay, my question is, in case of fire, well, the, the rocket Magla was very close to Mach 1, yeah. Yes. You know, I think that's a little heartbreaking for 
those of us who are in technology development, is that we work on many of these exciting projects and we bring them to a state where uh, we're hoping they go the next step. Uh, there is some interest. Uh, one of the uh, groups is the Colorado Department of Transportation is looking at a system to uh, move people from Denver Airport to the ski resorts. So they're considering advanced technology in the future. And uh, we have had significant interaction with them over the years. Uh, but uh, it's a very slow process. And there are several groups who are interested in cargo movement that are interested in that particular maglev system. But at this point, there's not much going on, unfortunately. It's a general atomics project, correct. But again, in the interest of time, uh, we have to uh, stop here. But again, I'm inviting to connect to the speaker or uh, probably one. Uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.